Hey everyone, this is Will with the CS Education Zoo. Welcome to show number 10. And I'm going to hand you off to Steve to introduce our guest. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Wolfman and uh, today we have uh, as our guest Kenya Sahara. Ken is a research scientist with the Center for Engineering, Learning, and Teaching at the University of Washington. His PhD is in computer science, but he's transitioned more broadly to engineering education. And he studies big picture issues in engineering education that often span many courses or disciplines. Uh, so he's done quite a bit of work on how engineering students understand and engage in design activities, which is obviously something very relevant to computer scientists as well. And he's recently embarked on a study of reflection in engineering education. Uh, it's also the case that Ken and I attended grad school together. Uh, and while we were there, I learned to uh, greatly respect his keen judgment in educational research and also his peaceful and inclusive perspective on life. So I'm really excited uh, to welcome him to the, to the show today. Ken? Thanks. thanks. It's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. So I'll just dive in. Um, like I said, you've been working on reflection. Uh, in engineering. So what I wanted to start with, uh, since n not everyone's necessarily going to be familiar with that word in a pedagogical context, <coughs> was to ask you if you could give us a little spiel about what reflection is uh, and why educators should be thinking about it. Sure, sure. But before I go into that, I should acknowledge that uh, this is, I'm just one small piece of a much larger uh, effort here. There's a consortium of 12 different institutions around the country um, that are they're working together with funding from the Helmsley Charitable Trust to help uh, more engineering educators understand um, and uh, understand reflection, how it might be valuable, and um, to to get them to uh, to get them to use reflection in their classes. Um, and that's the, well, not just classes, any educational setting really. Uh, so I can talk more about the consortium uh, later. I think there's already one on the, uh, the Zoo web page. But um, as for how we like to think about reflection, I guess I'll say that um, we're, we're trying to keep our notion of reflection pretty broad to, uh, to allow as many people to bring some good ideas to the table as possible. Um, so in its essential form, we like to think of it as looking back on some kind of experience uh, or a set of experiences, whether it's something that's just occurred or something that like was 10 years ago. Um, <clears throat> and uh, looking back on those experiences with the intention of learning um, something in particular. And there are lots of different things you can learn from the experience. Uh, I think most often when we think about education, there's a tendency to assume that we're talking about learning content or skills. Um, but I could talk a little bit later about how we like to think about it in broader terms than that. Uh, but anyway, so taking some kind of past experience or experiences, um, looking back on them to learn something, um, and a piece that maybe isn't quite as intuitive uh, is we also like to make sure that there's a looking forward to connecting that learning or connecting those past experiences to some kind of future action. And that could be something as simple as, um, you know, what am I going to do tomorrow when I go to lecture? Uh, or something much more significant, like, am I really in the right career path? Uh, do I want to go to graduate school? Um, am, I, am I really happy studying or I'm studying? So those are the three pieces. Looking back uh, with intention to learn from those experiences, connecting to some future action. And I think, you know, we're hoping that that hits the sweet spot. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Jennifer Kearns, um, likes this notion of uh, liberating constraints. Something that's constrained enough to be useful, but broad enough that there's a lot of room for creativity, a lot of to, to bring ideas from the production. Yeah. OK. Uh, the idea of, um, I mean, looking back and intending to learn, those are both things that I had thought about with reflection before. But the idea that you want to bring in looking forward as well uh, is kind of a new way to think about it for me. And I can certainly see how useful it would be. Um, hmm. uh, OK, so 
So give me an example. Uh, imagine I'm teaching class and uh, I'm going to carve out all of like two minutes time <laughs> in my class for reflection, if the, if that's plausible. Uh, and and I want to I want to have these pieces in there. Are, is there like one activity or a small number of activities that you'd suggest to me that would be most valuable? Sure. I'd say I guess the first thing that comes to mind is just um, a spin on the on the old favorite of the minute paper. Um, I think, you know, given the definition that I just gave for reflection, I think a lot of people recognize that many active learning or even classroom assessment techniques, a lot of these practices are related, if not, you know, fitting pretty cleanly underneath the umbrella of reflection as we defined it. With the minute paper, um, for example, at the end of your class, having students think about um, what they've done, what they've learned, and writing something down to some, some significant uh, nugget of uh, learning that they picked up. Now, that has, uh, as I've described it so far, that already has two of the ingredients. The, exp the prior experience is just that, you know, what are the 50 minutes or whatever that you just spent in class. Um, you're looking back on it, and maybe what you want to do is, as an educator, you might prompt your students to focus on a certain aspect of the, uh, of the class period. So perhaps the most obvious would just be something interesting that you've learned. But maybe maybe you could put a twist on it, like, is there something, um, is there some topic that you're worried about? Right? Some topic that you covered today, or something that happened in class today that you've been concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and that, that puts a particular lens on that experience. Um, and then, Perhaps you could augment the minute paper and fill the second minute. I'm glad you said two instead of one, because I, I don't know what I would do <laughs> if I didn't have that extra minute. You could have a follow-up question that says, well, what are you going to do about that? And, uh, now that you identified something that you're concerned about, um, how might you follow up as a student to address that concern? Uh, and it might be, um, you know, it might be a class activity, an in-class activity that kind of went badly or uncomfortably, so maybe the follow-up that the student might suggest to themselves as well, maybe I should just talk to the peers that I was working with. Uh, it might be some uh, in-class exercise that was really, really confusing, um, or a proof or something that just didn't make sense to them. So that might mean uh, visiting office hours or checking with the instructor right after the class. And you know, that's a, that's a really small, kind of like a nanoscale reflection, but we, we do think that, that that's, uh, that's a perfectly reasonable um, uh, instance of reflection, and, and one that hopefully um, somebody could fit in to pretty much any class setting, regardless of the experience that they're looking at. That sort of reminds me of... Um, <clears throat> I don't, I don't know, maybe it's totally unrelated, but I, I think it was Eric Mazur was doing work on how students learn from demos in physics. And, you know, they have all these fabulous demos that they do in physics. And, and he found that in a lot of cases, people just, you know, watch it as entertainment uh, and don't really learn anything from it unless you have them beforehand make a prediction and then watch the demo and then afterward ask, you know, what happened with their prediction, and, and this idea of, of reflecting back and at the same time saying you, you also need to look at how this will change what you're doing in the future has, has that sort of same flavor. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that's a great example, too, of, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I think uh, it's a great example or illustration of how there's a lot, I think, a lot of unmet potential in the, the educational experiences that we're providing for our students. Um, I think in that case, for example, you know, you go to all this trouble to put together a fantastic demo that you know is hitting all the right misconceptions, and um, <clears throat> and yet if you don't have that reflection around it, then it's altogether possible that that nothing will actually change, nothing will actually be done. Um, and I think if you think about the the kinds of uh, experiential learning experiences that more and more engineering students are having these days, um, that kind of reflective framework is missing from a lot of them, whether we think about co-ops and internships, um, capstone courses, um, 
even something as simple as a as a presentation in class or teamwork of a team project, um, we I think we perhaps only subconsciously as educators understand that there's a great deal to be learned from those kinds of experiences. Uh, but it's not really clear that students are getting that learning out of those experiences without the reflective framework. That's one of the things that motivated us to, to focus on reflection the way we do. <clears throat> OK, so but before we talked, I had in mind the, the, the next thing I was going to ask about is, OK, now I've got a bunch of time. And, and what am I going to do with reflection? But actually, as you were talking, I'm thinking about, uh, I just gave my students a midterm. Um, I'm thinking about, uh, you know, I, I grade the midterm, and I see all of these things that come up in the grading where uh, there's this misconception I, I wouldn't have imagined, and, and they're really struggling with this. So, you know, like to, to give a concrete example, they when they're reasoning about an algorithm that develops an optimal solution, they're having trouble seeing the difference between what's a solution and what's an optimal solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so, mm -hmm. is there anything sort of specifically in the context of an exam uh, that that you could recommend for a reflection activity for students? Uh, yeah, I've got a couple of buzzwords for you. Uh, exam wrapper. I don't know. Have you heard of exam wrappers before? And I, I mean, like, wrapping around a piece of candy, not like hip hop. Ah, did that come up on the tomorrow's prof list? I feel like I should have heard uh, of it. it. It might. It might have. Uh, I don't. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I haven't heard of it until earlier this year when I really started diving into reflection. Um, so exactly what you were describing doing as you were going through the exams, as you were grading, you know, looking at. Well, you know, what's what am I seeing as misconceptions? What's happened? What am I what am I um, what am I learning about my students' understanding of these concepts? You one thing that exam wrappers does is get the students to engage in that activity themselves. So the exam wrapper is a relatively simple idea. There are lots of variations, but what you do is you have the student um, take their graded exam and we're not talking about a huge essay. Just write a little bit, a few phrases about what they realized they were having trouble with, what they were struggling with, what they you know, more than just I got the question seven and thirteen wrong. But more conceptually, like I'm having trouble with this whole, you know, notion of an optimal solution. And then again, a follow-up question that says, "Well, what are you going to do about it? You know, uh, you've got a cumulative exam." coming up at the end of the term, how are you going to spend a little time addressing this misconception uh, going forward? <clears throat> and um, and that, I think, you know, is a nice example of a relatively lightweight thing that you can do. But not just, you know, why stop at your, as an educator, understanding what's going wrong or going well in your students' learning? Have them involved in that process as well. And the more habitual that becomes, hopefully, and the ideal case for the, the blue sky scenario is that students will go forth after your class, and every exam they take, they'll do their own little personal exam and, uh, and they'll become you know, the, the mythical uh, um, unicorn-like creature that we call a lifelong runner. Right? I mean, I mean, I, I'm joking, but I, I, I really do. That's I, I mean, people may think it's idealistic, but that's where we, we set the bar, I and mean, that's what we're hoping to achieve is to make these kinds of reflection activities so habitual for these students um, that, uh, that they're able to realize the benefits of all throughout their careers. And I think that's particularly important in engineering, particularly in computer science, um, where you know, everybody talks. It's, a, it's part of the folklore. Everyone understands that you have to keep learning in computer science. Perhaps the underlying fundamentals don't change from year to year, but everything moves so fast, right? That's, so yeah, maybe the exam wrapper is uh, is something you can try. And you can imagine how you could easily adapt that to a homework wrapper to uh, you know, insert experience here and wrap it. Now I don't want to create a lot of waste. Do I have to throw these wrappers away, or can I have a Well, just make sure you use the appropriate media, and you'll be fine. Okay, so so then now I'll I'll give you uh, I'll give you more than two minutes. I'll give you uh, I'll give you a whole class period. I have a I have a whole class period now. So, a so whole class period. 
a whole class period. What should I do now to to promote reflection? Um, you know, um, in a case like that, uh, you know, one of the things that I just spoke, well, one of the things that we're doing as part of the consortium effort is, um, and this is just the most joyful thing for me, I get to seek out educators on campus who are already using reflection in their courses and uh, interview them to learn more about these reflection activities that they're using so that we can publish um, uh, a field guide to reflection activities. And every one of the 12 campuses is going to produce uh, a field guide with a sampling of uh, 10 reflection activities each. Um, so one of the educators that I interviewed a couple of weeks ago does this interesting thing where um, after she has the students give some kind of technical presentation, uh, she has them um, write uh, a little reflection on what they did, uh, how, how they designed the presentation, um, both the visuals, the, the slides, as well as uh, how they planned their script of their it with it. Um, and then they have a chance to talk about uh, you know, reflect critically on what they did well, what they may need to improve, and how what, how they might change some things for the next time they need to do a presentation. Um, and I can imagine how you could adapt that to a sort of um, uh, practice talk-like situation where you have students who pair up, or groups that pair up, and give, for example, capstone final presentations to each other. Um, <clears throat> and this may be no, there, there's some logistical details that, that could be tricky. Uh, but uh, you could have students provide feedback to each other in this way and hopefully refine their presentations for uh, a final uh, presentation. This may be more time than you would put in a, particular, in, a, in a typical capstone course. But if you have a course that really does focus on technical communication, um, I think it makes sense to uh, it makes sense to, to try something like that. Great. All right. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna hand off to Will for the next step while I um, restore the integrity of my recording studio here. <laughs> I'll be right back. <laughs> dog, dog problems. Uh, okay. So so I guess my first question, Ken, is. Um, <clears throat> You know, with the example of uh, sort of the micro or nano reflection that you gave earlier with, you know, uh, maybe you don't understand something in the lecture, you want to look at that more closely or so forth. Um, you know, I found when I was a student or when I was teaching that many times, like I myself was aware, oh, okay, well, I, I need to start my homework earlier, or I really don't understand this proof, so I need to look at it. More, but then you know, beyond that, there was also sort of like a, an actualization phase where I actually had to to make the time to do it, or take the effort, or set aside something in my schedule, or, or meet with someone. You know, so you know, I, I hear I heard this all the time from my students saying, "Yeah, I know I need to start my assignment sooner, or I didn't understand this thing, and I need to go to office hours, but you know, I'm busy or whatever." So, do you have any? Uh, techniques or uh, you, you'd recommend or have you learned anything about how to take you know, some of that reflective knowledge and turn it into action even though that might be a lot of work or painful or you know uh, well no I mean you're right that's the next step right like um, connecting it to future action uh, isn't as valuable if the action never actually occurs um, I have to admit that uh, I haven't like we haven't thought specifically about a situation like the um, minute paper or, uh, you know, I think that's a scenario that in a situation like that, um, yeah, I mean, you know, we so we have a seminar here for students who, um, uh, it's kind of like a learning, a studying skills, study skills seminar, and that's a, that's a seminar in which I think we're trying to do a lot to help students um, develop better habits for studying, the kinds of things that will be valuable for them throughout their whole, whole career. Uh, and I think that's like, I don't know, um, 
you know, in a class like that, you may just have to have the students think about um, what their plans are and really uh, focus on the struggle they have to translate that into action. Um, uh, in a sense, I have to admit that, you know, uh, that that's really not um, the translation into action, to actual action, is something that I think uh, would have to be done on more on a more individual basis. Uh, but it's a, well, it's well, I, I guess you know. I guess you could even do things like you know having some of your reflection questions be things like you know like looking at your schedule. When do you think you would be able to? You know, make time to sure, sure. Although, I mean, I wonder if it might not make more sense to really directly ask the question, like, what is it that you're struggling with accomplishing as a better learner? You know, and, like, what do you, what do you think it is that's keeping you from doing it? Sure. Uh, and um, rather than so, rather than scaffold the way or the action, really just try to hone in on what might be what might be a hindrance for the student to follow through and make it to office hours or do that extra exercise. And then, you know, at some point, uh, I think, I guess, I'm a firm believer in that in the educational or institutionalized educational enterprise as a, as a joint, uh, uh, a jointly held responsibility. So at some point, we have to, you know, we have to say, well, you know, this is, I'm, I'm helping you to at least identify what the issue is, um, get some ideas on how to follow through, and uh, ultimately, you know, we can only meet them halfway. And so I, I also have a question about um, you know, whether or not reflection would be useful for sort of transferring technical skills uh, or, or trying to understand how technical skills could be applicable to other areas. So you know, what, one thing I saw many times in the programming language courses I've been involved with is that students would learn some technique like a program transformation that's broadly applicable, but they would focus on the fact that we applied it to this one particular example, right? right. And they wouldn't so necessarily recognize later. Yeah, they'd get fixated on that, not, that example, and they wouldn't really reflect on the fact that this is a general technique. And, right. and uh, we, we didn't really do very well in that area. I was wondering if you have any ideas about that from a reflection standpoint. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I would say that one of the nice things that um, uh, that reflection gives you a chance to do is encourage your students to make these kinds of connections, or at least consider them in the first place. Because I think um, there is a tendency for students to pick up on the wrong cues, so to speak, and say, "Well, that that was in you know that was in small font, so that's not gonna that's not gonna matter here, right?" Um, whereas, in fact, the, the concept holds true in the context of the, the new context that they're working in. And you know, encouraging them to spend a little more time than that, than that snap judgment um, by saying, well, no, hang on. Like, does this remind you of anything you've learned before? Right. And that's a question that's broad enough that it's not asking them to commit to, yes, this is directly applicable. I, had, I took this course. And, and um, opening it up like that for a moment might actually be a helpful way of um, Getting students to uh, to dig back and and more broadly consider what the present task or learning might be related to, and I've had like these fantastic experiences with students in a, in a portfolio uh, construction program that we did where um, we had engineering students who were further along, so upper level engineering undergraduates construct portfolios where they. Um, choose a set of uh, competencies that they feel that they've gained throughout their uh, educational career and provide some evidence for um, evidence and discussion to back that up. So a student who says, for example, um, I feel like I've developed really strong leadership skills. Um, we had a brainstorming phase where they, were, where they were asked to reflect back all of that to high school, like even further back if they wanted. Um, to, to see if they thought about, if they thought of experiences where they might have gained um, or built up some leadership skills. And students surprised themselves, even, in recognizing anew that an experience that they had 
written off as unrelated to engineering or engineering professional development is something that they recognize now as, uh, as an important early opportunity for them to develop a competency. And, and I, think, I think I could imagine a variety of analogs in the more, um, in this more conceptual space that, that, that we're talking about in this example. Uh, following up on that, you know, another area that <clears throat> has gotten a lot of attention uh, recently, and I think for good reason, is pair programming. Yeah. Do you think there are particularly good uses or special uses of reflection in the context of pair programming and how people can learn from that? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I haven't sat down to think about it specifically, but off the top of my head, it seems like such a rich opportunity, right? I mean, it's practically built in in the sense that, um, you know, it decouples the difficulty, the, the cognitive overload of trying to program and monitor or observe your own programming process at the same time as a, as a single individual, right? And that's a, that's a fantastic feature of this, this technique. Um, <clears throat> it encourages verbalization. It's kind of this real-time reflection on their process. Um, so there are many more, I guess, I would say many hooks for, for that kind of, of reflection to happen in a programming context. And I think with a little bit of scaffolding, you can really, um, uh, much like the physics demos, Mauser's Mas physics demos, you can really make sure as an educator that your students are getting as much as possible uh, out of the, the pair programming um, uh, configuration. And, and that might help, in particular, for students who are reluctant to engage in it or are unconvinced of the value of, um, of what might, to them, at first appear to be a rather kind of um, artificial or arbitrary uh, um, uh, arrangement that they've been asked to, to be in to do their work. What about ourselves as, as teachers um, and, and also as technical experts, you know, programmers? You know, what, what, uh, what techniques for reflection do you, do you use personally that you would think would be you know, broadly applicable to, to teachers or, or professional programmers or people trying to learn programming that maybe you are doing self-study or, or whatever, or you know, they already are graduated? Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, so... For the most part, we've been talking about students doing the reflecting and educators facilitating the reflection. Um, and uh, there's this whole other body of work thinking about reflective educators, right? Um, you know, educators who uh, who are turning that reflective lens uh, on themselves, on their own processes of, of teaching, on their own assumptions about teaching and learning. Um, I, I have to admit that. Uh, um, that's kind of been something I've reluctantly set aside to, to look at more closely just because there's so much to look at just in, in students reflecting. But I, I think there's a great deal of potential there as well. And, um, you know, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of writing out there, too, um, about reflective professionals or reflective practitioners, uh, like Donald Sherman. The, 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 stuff that, uh, the stuff that's out there you know, applies to educators as much as it does to engineers and uh, choreographers and, and poets and, you know, uh, any, really any profession. Um, and I think, you know, as, a, as an educator, <coughs> um, I think the, the reflection process and the way that you might scaffold it for yourself um, could easily involve things that, that are already out there as standard uh, instructional development practices, whether it's pure observation, for example, or um, like a little personal debrief. Um, I think there are many educators who already do this informally, uh, but the hope is, I think, that if you have kind of a more, slightly more formal um, notion of reflection, that it'll help you to engage in that reflection more productively and towards more defined, well, more, um, more definite, um, definite goals as, a, as an educator. But it, it's a great question. It's an area that I, I have to say I you know, haven't had as much time to think of. 
Do, do you think it's uh, particularly useful for a teacher to um, sort of demonstrate some of their own reflective uh, te techniques or their own use of reflection in the classroom so the students can see it? Is that, you know, to what sure. extent is that important or desirable? Sure. As with anything that's pedagogically unusual, um, I think it, it's very important for the educator to expect that there'll be some resistance or at least some confusion on the part of the students. Um, uh, so, you know, what, why aren't you just lecturing to me? Like, why am I being asked to do this reflection thing? Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and, yeah, certainly modeling that can be a valuable way of communicating or demonstrating or making more visible the value of reflection. Um, I think it, I, I can only imagine it would, uh, it would be very valuable also in uh, garnering just good old-fashioned goodwill with, uh, with your students, too, if they realize how earnestly you're taking this uh, responsibility of uh, teaching them, that you're actually spending some time um, uh, after every lecture doing a little deeper, or having a, an observer, a peer, come in. You know, that, that's the kind of thing that I think makes it very clear that um, you're trying your best, you know, and you're taking this part of your job as a faculty member <clears throat> uh, really seriously. Okay, so <clears throat> let, me, let me jump in and um, steal a, a question that came up when we were talking to Mark Guzdow. So he, he, was, uh, he was speaking about computing education in high schools. Uh -huh. and, uh, and the discussion he had, which was uh, interesting and a little provocative, was, uh, was what's more important, uh, computing education in K-12 or high-quality computing education in K-12? So, so let uh -huh. me ask you the same question about <coughs> What's more important, just making time for reflection with even if you don't do anything particularly well thought out or making sure that you have quality time? So I, I, have, a, um, I have at least an anecdote that, that reminds me of immediately um, that, leads, that would lead me to the answer that it's, uh, it's probably better not to do reflection at all. Um, if you don't think you can, uh, if, if you don't think you're prepared to facilitate it effectively. Although I have to add again that it doesn't have to be that complicated. It doesn't mean that you have to go to uh, three-week training, professional development training. Um, <clears throat> it just means that you have certain things in mind that you do it intentionally and transparently, um, just as you would. Uh, I mean, to me, this question is analogous to the question of: Is it better to do active learning badly? Than not at all. Um, and I would say the same thing, that like, if you're going to do active learning badly, just, if you think it's going to go badly, just wait. Wait until you have the time to, to give it the earnest effort it requires to, to go well. It's bad for the students. It's bad for you as an educator. Um, and in fact, it may be bad for the students, sorry, for the future educators that those students encounter. Uh, and the anecdote that I was reminded of is, um, my director, uh, their, uh, her children have gone through a public school system where they've been asked to do things that are labeled as reflection um, over and over to the point that they're actually pretty sick of it. And they have kind of a, um, based on that experience, they have kind of a negative, um, you know, immediately negative reaction to anything that's labeled reflection. So one of the subtleties that we talk about with our educators a lot is that you can intend for it to be a reflection. You can have this structure of looking back and applying a lens to learn something and connecting to future action, but you don't have to call it reflection for it to be effective. And in fact, there may be good reasons not to call it reflection. Um, it's a word that obviously has, you know, unlike metacognition, um, reflection is a word that's used colloquially all the time. And uh, in that sense, we really don't know where any individual student or even educator's starting point is with this notion. And for some people, it may be like, oh, that sounds like we have to talk about our feelings. Or, like, I'm not really into that. I'm an engineer. Like, we are somewhat unfair stereotype, but, but you know, um, 
if students have bad experiences uh, with um, insufficiently planned or uh, you know, uh, um, organized reflection activities in our, that are labeled as reflection, that can actually make it really difficult for uh, a well-intentioned and capable educator later um, who's trying to, to make that happen in earnest. So in that sense, I would say probably better to do without. Um, after all, there's a whole lot of education that's going on out there without facilitated reflection. And I think we can agree it hasn't been a total disaster. Uh, but you know, how many stories have you heard of, of educators who um, <clears throat> who say, "Oh, I tried that active learning thing; it's it's not for me." Mm -hmm. And in some cases, it's really not. But in many, many cases, you know, you dig a little bit deeper and you hear about the story of what happened. You find out that it was like a quarter, a term, and they tried it maybe twice, um, but they they didn't give them enough time. They didn't give themselves enough time. Uh, they didn't have um, the kind of understanding to give themselves a fair shot to making it successful. And then, you know, and then you start hearing um, students saying things like, you know, I'm paying tuition for you to tell me what to understand, not for me to talk to my stupid peer who I can't learn anything from. I, I, as educators, we, we know how much potential there, potential there is in that kind of collaborative learning scenario. But the, the jaded or cynical student who's had one or two really uh, unfortunately memorable bad experiences with active learning or reflection or you name it, you name the innovation, um, you know, right out of the gate, um, they're, they're a challenge. And you really have to bring them over from the negative side to, to get them to buy into the potential. So anyway, that's a long answer, but uh, probably, probably better to, to wait until you can nail it. Let's well, get well uh, can I can I ask a follow up to that then? I mean, what um, to you? What does it mean to do uh, reflection well? Uh, what what are you know what are some of the techniques or tips that you would give people who who want to experiment or or to improve their use of reflect reflection? Um, yeah, I mean, for a successful outcome, uh, really, I would say as long as there's evidence that the students are taking it seriously. Uh, which is generally pretty obvious in the responses they provide, uh, whether verbally or written uh, to a reflection exercise, then, then I think it's successful. Right? Again, we're, we're setting the bar at having them think about future action. Um, and uh, if you see that kind of connection being made, I think you're successful. Um, to make that happen, well, a lot of the general things apply. Like I was saying earlier, as soon as you depart from um, what students are used to seeing in the classroom. Um, I think you do have to at least put a little bit of effort to explain what you're doing, why it has value, um, how it works. And, and I'm not talking about taking 15 minutes. Uh, this could be a relatively simple discussion. But just to, to reassure these students, this is not some arbitrary exercise that I'm having you engaging, there's some very good reasons. You know, the, the learning sciences back, back me up here when I ask in, in my reasons for asking you to, to do something other than um, uh, sit here and listen to me lecture or watch slides go by. Uh, so a lot of that general stuff applies. In, with reflection in particular, I think, again, being careful about how you label it. Um, it need not be labeled reflection. Uh, in fact, you know, in engineering, there are lots of different terms that I think come pretty close to capturing the, the essence of, uh, of reflection as I've described it, whether that's a debrief or, um, you know, uh, people talk about like a project postmortem or um, I have a friend who, uh, who has some military experience who tells me that there's this thing, I think I don't remember, um, there's this thing that they do after operations or exercises called a hot wash. That uh, that's basically the same thing. You, you all come back together after uh, an operation or an exercise. Everybody who is involved is given kind of equal standing at a table to discuss what went well and what went wrong. Um, so I, I think there are lots of ways to label it, and I think you want to be sensitive to your audience and what preconceptions they may have. 
about uh, uh, about the activity, or really how you label the activity, so that you give them a chance to, to give it a, a fair shot. Um, and then beyond that, I really don't think, um, in the experiences of the educators that I've had a chance to interview so far, uh, if you have those ingredients, you know, if you have um, questions that are answerable, so not just um, uh, not just something so open-ended as, so how did that team project go? Okay. But perhaps something more concrete, like think about your last group meeting for this project team. Okay. And identify two things that you felt were going well in that meeting, and two things that perhaps the team needs to work on. And then you know, write down at least one idea on you know, how you might Suggest to your teammates that uh, you might work on on one of those one of those issues. That that's much more manageable cognitively, uh, it, it's, um, and yet there's still lots and lots of room for the team to really for each individual team to attend to whatever issues um, are are serve, are, are um, giving them giving them some trouble. So I don't think it has to be that complicated. But a lot of the usual advice, I think. For, for doing anything innovative in the classroom. So, so I've got a follow-up on what Will was asking about uh, the, a good form for reflection. Um, and I, I've done things like minute papers in the past, but I usually haven't incorporated this idea of, of looking forward uh, mm -hmm. to what students will do in the future. Um, and, and one thing I found very important with minute papers uh, in my classes is to make sure that um, that I close the loop with students. So what I usually do is I, I toss them into piles and count yeah. frequency of piles and themes that come up. And then I come into the class and I talk about, you know, here were the five most common things. Here's how common they were. I'm going to be able to address these two. Here's why I can't address this one. You know, I hope it goes better in subsequent terms, and so on and so forth. And I feel like not doing that leaves me in a problematic situation where they feel like things just get sucked into a black hole and that's that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you mentioned that. I should, I should have said that in response to Will's question as well. I think you know, we really want to make sure that you're honoring the time that they, that they take, even if it's just a minute, right? Like, if, if you really do want your students to take this reflection engagement seriously, then you need to make visible how seriously you're taking it as well. Um, not to mention the usual benefits, right, of <clears throat> uh, you know, 30 people Reflecting on a topic together are many times more powerful than other people individually reflecting and not talking to each other. Um, so even if you do have an individual reflection of the minute paper or another point exercise, um, uh, you can certainly scale up the benefit as the educator by kind of aggregating and summarizing, synthesizing the results. And yeah, I mean, I would be willing to bet that the time that it takes to do that, um, both in terms of signaling to the students how seriously you take reflection, but also the, the increased understanding you have of where your students are, is, uh, is well worth it. So I, I uh, guess what I what I want to ask additionally, though, is, is is there something specific I should be thinking about now when I ask them how they'll be changing their practice in the future, like a different way to respond to to that kind of question? Um, a different way to, for students to respond to that question, you mean? No, for me to respond to the question, because I've, I've, I mean, I've asked them to do this reflection. I, I don't know if I'm, if I'm collecting it in this scenario or if I'm leaving it with them, but, but how do I close the loop with them on it? Oh, sure. So let's say you do collect it, um, or at least you have, uh, you have a sample of students provide some responses. Um, yeah, then I think it makes sense um, for you to. Um, uh, for you to share, <coughs> me, share with the students the different ways that that they're coming up with for, for addressing some of the um, some of the difficulties they're having with with the muddiest point, whatever the muddiest point was. And again, I think that helps to um, that helps 
everybody in the class benefit from the variety of ideas that students have for being better learners. Is that the right question? Yeah, I think so. Um, and yeah. I think that's that's the way I would close the loop with a with a, an exercise, a reflection exercise. Like that. Okay. So the beginning of the next um, class period, I would say, you know, here here are the kinds of responses I got um, for a muddiest point, for example. And in addition to the usual response, like, well, you know, because I saw so many of you identifying um, you know, running time as a as a muddiest point. We're going to spend a little extra time at the start of today's class. And then you could also say, um, you know, here are the, the many different ways that each of you are talking about addressing the muddiest points. And I think it's important for you to, for all of you, to hear these things because you know, the more uh, the more tools in your toolbox, the more ways that you're aware of to respond to, to difficulties in learning, the better a student will be because different different responses will suit different students. All right. I got a question for you. Since you get to go around and talk to people who are already using reflection, you know, is there a particularly interesting or surprising or deep use of reflection that you've seen? Is there sort of like, wow, here's here's really a gold standard use of reflection or something that was really surprising to me that you know, I didn't realize I hadn't thought of that use, or you know, or, or do you think most of the uses, you know, kind of follow uh, fall into the maybe the standard sorts of things we think of with metacognition or reflection? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, from my point of view, uh, you know, I'm only about halfway done with my interviews, so there's a lot more to hear about still. But one of the things that I thought was brilliant, that, you know, if I'm ever in a situation where I'm having students do group work. Uh, I will be certain to give this a try. It's a little complicated, but um, <clears throat> uh, essentially what you do is you have the students think back on the group work experiences they've already had, um, positive and negative. Uh, and you have them spend a little time identifying what features or what, what made those experiences pleasant or unpleasant, successful or unsuccessful. Um, <clears throat> and then based on that reflection, you have them um, establish within groups, you have them establish uh, a group contract, um, which, and this is a notion that I haven't really uh, heard about before, or at least not uh, not with this connection back to this reflective exercise. So the reflective exercise is kind of the basis or the preparation for students to do a thoughtful job of coming to some consensus within the groups about the expectations that they have for each other as team members. Uh, and they and they commit that to writing. And that becomes the basis um, of uh, the peer evaluations that the students do uh, throughout the course of the term long project, say. Um, uh, so they're, they're basically making their own rubrics for um, for team participation, and in such a you know, to me it was so compelling because it, it, I mean, it's so much more authentic. It, it really empowers the students. Um, it uh, it gives students an opportunity to take experiences with teamwork um, that perhaps weren't that they perhaps had written off as waste of time, and gain something from it, right? Gain some insight about um, what makes teams work or not work, even if it's only to, to say, well, we should make sure to not let this happen. Yeah. I've been through that. And, yeah. um, and uh, that, to me, I think, has lots of nice qualities, this notion of putting students in charge of their own learning and teamwork management, but also this quality of having students revisit an experience that perhaps they had written off as um, having no value, and realizing that there is something we can get out of it. And I think that's one of the interesting um, features of reflection is that it, uh, it allows you to go back to an experience and be surprised. And it's something that you went through yourself, and you think you understand completely, perhaps. Uh, you think you're done learning from that experience. 
and yet with the appropriate lens, with the appropriate training, um, they're able to discover things anew from, from that. And I think that's, to me, that to me is one of the, the really powerful elements of, uh, of the culture. Very cool, thank you. All right, uh, yes, yeah, Steve, um, I will let you have the last question if you want it. All right, uh, time has flown by. We are near the end. So, uh, Ken, I, I wanted to ask you, we, we, we've got a couple of regular questions I usually ask. I don't know that we've got time for both of them, so I, I was just going to ask you uh, one of them, sure. um, which is what's something you think every computer scientist should read or learn or do or play with? Uh, oh boy. Well, I guess um, the obvious answer with my consortium hat on is, uh, is, to, is to really think about you know, how important it is for, for students in computer science in particular to become lifelong learners and how reflection and developing habits of reflection can really be a cornerstone in, uh, in that kind of, not just um, academic or intellectual development, but, but you know, even bigger things. So we didn't talk too much about identity development and things like that, but we really do believe that reflection has a great deal of potential as well. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, the other thing I'll briefly mention is uh, digging back to my earlier years looking at research in computer science and gender, which um, I still do have like a, a little side project on with. Um, with a couple of good friends of mine, um, we, uh, I would have to say that more, more, more recently, the, the most powerful social science, social psychology um, work that I've run across is Carol Dweck's work on mindset and how powerful student and educator assumptions about um, how much students can achieve effort versus um, how much student achievement is uh, predetermined by environment or by you know, fate or whatever. How, how powerful just that attitudinal shift can be in, uh, in influencing outcomes. And it's, it's such hopeful and uh, almost, you know, it, it's a kind of work that I think is so powerful that it's kind of spooky. And uh, I think it's not just something that I think every educator needs to see, but I would say every parent, anyone who really works with children. Um, uh, I think that, that's, that's the kind of thing that I would, I would put on the table. There's, um, there's a book that I think is just called Mindset, but I think it does a, a nice job of laying out the findings for a lay audience. I've only read excerpts of it, but there's a ton of papers, too. All right. I'm glad you repeated that. I, I was going to double check whether it was her work on mindset or Minecraft that we were <laughs> supposed to be looking at. I'm sure both are great. All right, so Carol Dweck's work on mindsets. And that actually sets us up well for, for how we usually close off, which is uh, to give our guests an opportunity for any shout-outs you want to make. Um, you'd mentioned earlier uh, talking briefly about the group there. Um, anybody you want to mention? Any organizations, you know, websites, software, books? Uh, well, certainly, I would have to say that um, you know the the person who's really been carrying the torch here at Kelt uh, with reflection and who has even more expertise is Jennifer Trends, um, and she's one of the co-directors of the consortium, um, along with Cindy Atman, who's the director of the center here. Um, and uh, the the other person I guess I'll, I'll mention is uh, Jim Fork with Parnell. Jim is our associate director and our instructional developer here. Um, one of our instructional developers, and he's done some really fantastic work, uh, including providing this um, group work reflection activity example that I mentioned. Um, I feel like I feel like I could spend 30 years and not learn half of what I could from him about uh, about education, um, in particular in engineering and um, about working with faculty to, uh, to help them uh, achieve their goals and improve them. 
you know, I, I was I was going to, uh, after that I was going to close and have Will and I do our usual closing spiel, but I feel like in view of what we've just discussed, I have to ask, is there anything we should think about about what we've learned during <laughs> Miss CS Education Zoo? Uh, and well, I think, we can... well, you've already told me that you actually do a debrief. We do. Um, so I, I think you're already, you know, I mean, whether you call it reflection or not, or whether it's conscious or not, I think you're already well... On the uh, well on board, I think uh, I think you've got everything set up. Excellent. Yeah. Well, well, we'll sign off then. And when we stop the public broadcast, I want everyone to know immediately afterward we will have a hot wash. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Ken. Uh, this okay. has been great. I appreciate it. I appreciate. I appreciate you taking the time. <clears throat> All right. And hopefully, I can get down there and go biking with you sometime. Uh, oh, that'll be fantastic. Um, all right, Will, I, I don't think we have our next zoo scheduled right now, but uh, we talked about maybe trying to interview a few people while I was up at SIGSE, uh, down, across, whatever, soon, <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we might, get some, uh, we might get some zoo activities in then, and, uh, and otherwise we'll be scheduling some more soon. Um, yeah, good. Sounds fun. All right. We'll see you all next time, and thank you very much for coming and watching.